Patricia Highsmith and her protagonist, Tom Ripley, shared numerous attributes, one of them being a turbulent temper, another being an attraction towards a more dramatic life. She was unhappy if an affair was going well, thus tended to stir up trouble with her multiple lovers if things were too calm. She felt most creative in a state of high tension and would make an effort to create the desired atmosphere. When most in love, she fantasized about strangling her partners. Fortunately, she expressed this desire for violence in her writing and not in real life. When speaking of her character Tom Ripley, she would speak of him as if he was a person who was very close to her, almost like a family member. She'd defend him if anyone spoke down about him and would speculate what he would have said in regards to particular situations. At the end of a letter to a friend, High Smith signed herself Pat H. alias Ripley. To her, Ripley was very real. Like Ripley, High Smith was a social climber and intensely aware of status. Most of her girlfriends were upper middle class or rich, well connected, and preferably married as that added to the excitement and drama of the relationship. Also like Ripley, she constantly fantasized. Even in her journals, she seemed incapable of distinguishing between reality and her inventions, which is maybe just why her writings are still relevant. The year she began writing the talented Mr. Ripley, she was already struggling with alcoholism. Ever since her days at Barnard College, she had been a heavy drinker, but by 1954 her alcohol consumption was becoming dangerously high. As if that wasn't enough, she was bothered by an infected tooth, her possessions were scattered across the country, and her latest lover had recently left her. Still, there was something, something which she described as an inner strength that kept her going. So instead of wallowing in self-pity, she indulged in the high tension surrounding her life at the time and began to flesh out the plot for her next book. Early titles included Pursuit of Evil, The Thrill Boys, and Business Is My Pleasure, before she eventually settled on the title which we know the novel by today. Welcome to House of Words, a podcast about writers, the dramatic, and the murderous. I'm your host, Jason Nemore Hardin, and today we are exploring Patricia Highsmith's novel, The Talented Mr. Ripley. Quote, I don't set the alarm to get up. I get up when I feel like it. End quote. Patricia Highsmith was born Mary Patricia Plangman in Fort Worth, Texas on January 19, 1921. In a poem from 1942, she referred to how she'd been born under an unlucky star. In truth, it was nothing short of a miracle that she was even born alive at all, considering her mother had attempted to terminate the pregnancy by drinking turpentine, an act which would be the beginning of their dysfunctional relationship. Nine days after giving birth, her mother divorced Patricia's biological father. And when Patricia was four, her mother married Stanley Highsmith, which devastated young Patricia. She never forgave the man who was a rival for her mother's affections. Case in point, she was left with her grandmother, Willie May, while her mother and new husband, Stanley, went to Manhattan to seek their fortunes and would remain with her grandmother until age six, the two of them forming a deep bond. Now, despite her feelings towards Stanley, she would eventually take his surname. Considered to be highly gifted when it came to writing was not so surprising given that she was a bookworm who began reading adult literature at an early age. As puberty hit and she began to discover herself, writing in notebooks and diaries would help her to reflect and come to terms with, among other things, her sexuality. She noticed an attraction towards the same sex during her school years and had her first lesbian experience at the age of 14. Later in life, she would reflect in a notebook that she felt more like a male in a female body 
than like a woman who was attracted to women. Unsurprisingly, she didn't receive any support from her mother whom rejected the teenager's homosexuality. Naturally affected by the discovery of her sexuality, her early short stories concerned her longings for women, including The Price of Salt, which would later be published under the title Carol under the pseudonym Claire Morgan. The tipping point of evil is a major theme in Patricia's novels, a topic that already began to fascinate her as a child and which she dove deeper into upon discovering the book The Human Mind by German-American psychologist Karl Menninger in her grandmother's library. Questions like, why do regular people become murderers, and when do they give up their morals, arose from reading the book. These were questions that would soon find their way into her writing and become the focus of almost all her works. At 30 years old, just having graduated from Barnard College in New York and working in a comic book store to make ends meet, Alfred Hitchcock bought her story, Strangers on a Train, for $8,000. A little did she know at the time that it would be her first step into the rest of her career. The story she began fleshing out in 1954 concerned the titular Mr. Ripley, a low-income stockroom clerk for the IRS, a nobody who bitterly resents his sleazy New York City friends. He's a petty thief who feels not a shred of guilt impersonating a tax collector in order to fleece vulnerable people. When by chance he meets Mr. Greenleaf, the rich father of a vague acquaintance, he pretends to be an Ivy Leaguer who is a good friend of Mr. Greenleaf's son. Fooled and charmed by Ripley, Mr. Greenleaf buys Ripley a first-class ocean liner ticket to Europe and finances a six-week stay in the Italian coastal town of Mongebello, where his son, Dicky is living as a self-serious, although talentless, painter. Though Dickie's mother is dying of leukemia, he refuses to return home to comfort her. After all, he has a villa, a sailboat, a maid, and an American admirer. Life is well. Now, Tom Ripley's mission given by Dickie's father is to charm Dickie, become his best friend, and eventually persuade him to return to the U.S. and... To his dying mother. As the story unfolds, Tom quite literally becomes Dicky, murdering him and assuming his identity. He wears Dicky's clothes, signs Dicky's checks, even writes letters on Dicky's old typewriter. Switching his old New York persona for that of the Europeanized golden boy, Tom comes to feel much better about himself and embraces his new persona fully. Quote, anticipation. It occurred to him that his anticipation was more pleasant to him than the experiencing. A quoted line from the talented Mr. Ripley. Now, thinking back to a young man she had seen in the village of Positano in Italy in 1952, the isolated figure strolling down the beach at six in the morning, High Smith started plotting the novel at the end of March 1954, just before they split with her latest girlfriend. She jotted down some initial thoughts about the central character and found that it would be a young American man living in Europe. And the portrait she initially sketched out, although significantly different from the Ripley of the finished book, bears traces of both the amoral but charming psychopath and his victim and love object, Dickie Greenleaf. At this point in the process, she imagined Tom Ripley to be an amateur painter, half homosexual with an adequate private income, who found himself caught up in a smuggling plot. As the story progressed, she envisioned him discovering that he had a talent for, and took pleasure in, killing, and as a result, he is used by a gang to carry out their dirty work. In her notes, she wrote, his name should be Clifford, or David, or Matthew. After jotting down ideas and fleshing out the plot, she sat down to write the piece in a rented cottage near Lenox, Massachusetts, which she had rented for the summer of 1954. She described her mood at the time of starting the book as being bucolic. 
Certainly her life was more relaxed after the emotional turmoil of the last few years. And while in Lennox, she spent her days going to the local library, reading de Tocqueville's Democracy in America and flicking through Italian grammar books between writing sessions and drinking. Nevertheless, this serene attitude soon proved not to be working to her advantage, and after writing 75 pages of material, she decided her prose was too flaccid. She scrapped the whole attempt and made a mental and physical effort to sit on the edge of her chair as she started from scratch again. It became a popular book because of its frantic prose, she would later tell, and the insolence and audacity of Ripley himself. By thinking myself inside the skin of such a character, my own prose became more self-assured than it logically should have been. It became entertaining. Her landlord was an undertaker, and she became fascinated by the minute details of his job, particularly the tree-shaped incisions he made in corpses before he opened them up, as well as the material he used to stuff the bodies, sawdust being the secret. The wisdom into the macabre methods of an undertaker must have certainly helped her inspiration. In her notebook while plotting the novel in October 1954, she noted, What I predicted I would once do, I am doing already in this very book, that is, showing the unequivocal triumph of evil over good and rejoicing in it. I shall make my readers rejoice in it too. Thus, the subconscious always precedes the consciousness or reality, as in dreams. Quote, When I am thickening my plots, I like to think, what if? What if? Thus my imagination can move from the likely, which everyone can think of, to the unlikely, but possible, my preferred plot. End quote. The Talented Mr. Ripley is a dark reworking of Henry James's The Ambassadors, which Highsmith had read in 1940 and which she thought was rather overwritten and overlong. But she did like the story enough to borrow elements from it. The most obvious parallels between the two novels is when the character Lambert Strether is sent by Mrs. Newsom to find her son, Chad, in Paris and return him back to his home in America. The name of the novel's writer, Henry James, is also mentioned in Highsmith's novel when an amused Herbert Greenleaf asks Tom Ripley whether he has read a particular work by James. It is further stressed when Ripley requests a copy of the book in the library on board the liner taking him from America to Europe. The novel also attests to Highsmith's knowledge of Europe, the trains, the hotels, the languages, the towns, as well as the characters found on the continent. All Ripley novels would be set in Europe from then on, and for a reason. Highsmith first traveled there in 1949 by ship and was taken by it. In her notebook and diary, she writes, My most persistent obsession that America is fatally, from my point, an artist's point of view, off the road of the true reality, that the Europeans have it precisely. Further similarities between Ripley and Highsmith are apparent. She had experienced at first hand many of Ripley's characteristics, a splintered identity, insecurity, inferiority, obsession with an object of adoration, and the violence that springs from repression, which may help explain why the novel came so easily to her and how she was able to complete the book in six months. Writing was less a source of pleasure for her than a compulsion without which she was miserable. She usually wrote in the morning and midday, after having completed what she referred to as the boring chores of the day, shopping, cleaning, and or writing a business letter. Then she would sit down by the typewriter and work for four or five hours with the goal of completing eight to ten pages a day. Then the rest of the day would be free to indulge however she pleased. Later, Highsmith would tell how it felt like Tom Ripley was writing the novel instead of her. As if Ripley was using her as a vessel, the words and sentences just spilled out of her. While writing the novel, she wrote in her notebook, Happiness, for me, is a matter of imagination. Existence is a matter of unconscious elimination of negative and pessimistic thinking. I mean, 
to survive at all, and this applies to everyone, we are all suicides under the skin and under the surface of our lives. Using her own profession as a template, she made Ripley something close to an author. Although he is not an author by profession, there is a suggestion that, with his uncanny mimetic skills and his dynamic creative imagination, writing could be the greatest of his talents. Now, early in the novel, while Ripley is sailing to Europe, he sits down to write what is, at first, a polite thank-you note for providing him with such comfortable accommodation. Then his imagination takes over and the letter turns into a fantastical account of life with Dicky, whom in fact he has not yet met. His stories were good, Highsmith wrote about Ripley's writing talent, because he imagined them so intensely, so intensely that he came to believe them. When near the end of the novel, Ripley is forced to let go of the character he has worked so hard to become and return to his own self. He is, like a novelist who has fallen in love with its protagonist, utterly miserable. After all, being oneself again was so boring after the excitement and drama of pretending to be someone else, which seems like a fitting metaphor to why writers write fiction. The book reads, He hated becoming Thomas Ripley again, hated being nobody, hated going back to himself as he would have hated putting on a shabby suit of clothes, a grease-spotted, unpressed suit of clothes that had not been very good even when it was new. By the end of the book, Tom Ripley gets away with two murders and, instead of being caught or punished, is let off scot-free. By doing this, the novel is not only a radical celebration of amorality, but also a challenge to the reader, in particular at the time it was first published in the mid-1950s, forcing reflection concerning one's own morality and ethics. When Highsmith had finished The Talented Mr. Ripley, she sent a copy of the manuscript to her beloved grandmother, the same one with the library where she had first discovered her predilection for the macabre, because she was afraid the old woman might die before its publication late in 1955. On the 5th of February, 1955, her 88-year-old grandmother collapsed just outside the house where Patricia was born. As a note, there is no verification of whether the grandmother actually read the book before her passing. Good reviews greeted the talented Mr. Ripley upon it being published in December of 1955. The New Yorker found the novel's hero to be one of the most repellent and fascinating characters of modern times. Highsmith, the anonymous reviewer concluded, told her remarkably immoral story very engagingly. Connoisseur of detective fiction Anthony Boucher praised the author for her unusual insight into a particular type of criminal. He described Ripley as a three-dimensional portrait of what a criminal psychologist would call a congenital psychopathic inferior. The novel went on to win numerous awards, including the Edgar Allan Poe Scroll presented in April of 1956 by the Mystery Writers of America. A few years later, when the certificate became mildewed, she removed the glass to clean it, but before she hung it back on her bathroom wall, she scribbled the words, Mr. Ripley and, before her own name. She thought that Tom Ripley deserved the honor as much as she did. And in a way, he did. As she would say, I often had the feeling Ripley was writing it and I was merely typing. Unfortunately, fame came too quickly and became too overwhelming for her. As her reputation skyrocketed, she would most often withdraw from public, later moving to Europe living a rather reclusive life. Though a chronic alcoholic for the rest of her life, she would continue to write up until her death. Throughout her career, she would go on to write 22 novels in addition to numerous short stories, essays, and articles, two of which were about another passion of hers, snails. In an interview that she gave on Swiss television in 1974, she said that she liked snails as pets, explaining her interest because they have not changed for millions of years. Ever eclectic, she told how she liked taking snails for walks in her purse. 
As usual, let me leave you with one final quote from the immensely talented Twofold Arthur. The first person you should think of pleasing in writing a book is yourself. If you can amuse yourself for the length of time it takes to write a book, the publisher and the readers can and will come later. End quote. Thank you for listening. I hope you've enjoyed this episode and will spread the word about the podcast. Once again, I have been your host, Jason Nemore Harden. We here at House of Words ask that you please consider helping to make this show easier to produce and more frequent by contributing on our Patreon page at patreon.com slash house of words. Until next time, keep turning those pages. House of Words is written and produced by Cristo M. Sanchez, narrated and edited by me, Jason Nemore Harden, and music by Creature Nine and Wood. All rights and ownership belong to Cristo M. Sanchez and Jason Nemore Harden. <laughs>